itself takes up about nine acres of that area. Um, so there's two separate areas to this project. Um, the larger one is on the landfill. Uh, it's up on the top portion of the landfill, the flatter portion you can see here. And this portion of the project is ballasted uh, with these large concrete blocks. Um, because it's a landfill, we can't damage the landfill cap. Um, so these blocks, you know, we mow the grass down really short and, and uh, place a gravel uh, foundation that's compact and so it's got a nice foundation. And uh, that way we don't damage the cap and there's no settling. Um, so those are ballasted that way up on the landfill. And over here, these are ground mounted posts that are ground screws um, that are just driven into the ground because they're supported that way. Um, so in total, there's about 94% open space. And when we're done, there's going to be about 93%. So really, there's not a lot of uh, impervious area in regards to stormwater. And we've been having a lot of contact with the DPW um, through this permitting process and uh, just received approval for our stormwater permit today. Um, there was some question about runoff in the transfer station area where we're sending a, a small amount of flow of less, less than uh, one half CFS uh, cubic foot per second. But we're just mimicking the same um, drainage uh, flow paths and entering the, drain, the same drainage structure that's there. Um, there's some catch basins and culverts and eventually it's it way out to a wetland there. It's, it's really good for the change there. Um, and there was also some question about this area down here where we made some changes to add in a grass swale and a little infiltration area there. So we're gonna capture um, the pre and post development flow so that the post development calculations is, is less than pre development. So, uh, so we got that approval this afternoon. Um, and Joel or Jim, do you wanna speak on some detail on the solar panels? Sure. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Joel Lindsay. I'm a director of project development with Amoresco. And uh, as Drew said, uh, AMEC is our civil consultant. We're going to be the owner and uh, builder of this system. Uh, this system is being built uh, under a contract with the city. This is uh, a system that's actually, uh, the city went out for bid uh, some months ago. We've been working with them for some time on uh, getting the contracts done and, and now we're, we've been moving into the permitting phase. Um, so the system, is, as Drew said, he kind of described the basic physical layout of it. Uh, the system actually is going to produce probably right around 4 million kilowatt hours per year, and that's going to uh, actually generate a considerable amount of savings for the city in terms of uh, net metering credits. And uh, that's something that we've been working, actually, Chris Mason is here uh, tonight from the Sustainability Department, and, and we've been working closely with Chris on moving the project along um, and uh, getting to this point. I'll also mention we actually have uh, did file with the DEP all these projects. We do a lot of landfills in the state. All these projects have to get a DEP post closure use permit. And uh, that's really critical because DEP obviously has a very large stake in making sure that nothing is done to uh, impair the operation of the cap uh, for these landfills. <coughs> and so uh, we worked with AMAC to make that filing, and we did get uh, that permit from DP uh, probably a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and that involved uh, actually quite a bit of analysis on the loading of the, of the blocks. As, as Drew said, these are pretty large concrete blocks, but they all sit on top. Everything is on top of the landfill. Nothing can go, not even any of the wiring, all the conduit is above ground. Um, we don't. It's the, the, the ground mount portion that's over here is, is a little bit different where we are able to drive posts. Um, and so it's a slightly different configuration, but it actually ends up looking very similar. Uh, the panels themselves, uh, some of you, you know, I'm sure you see them, you see what they look like. They're basically on racks that, uh, the, the, the racks, they're all oriented to face south and they're at about roughly a 15 degree angle. The panels themselves are each about three by five or three by six, but they're in large trays sitting on these racks and you can see a concrete block that holds up the, the racking structure. And then the bottom part is probably the, the lowermost point of the panel is probably two feet off the ground, two and a half, three feet off the ground, just to give you a sense. Uh, the top part is probably eight feet. Um, and we are able to run with the contours of the site 
as Drew said, we really don't have to do a lot of alteration. I mean, actually, we don't have to do hardly any alteration on the site, uh, which is a nice feature of it because obviously, you know, I mean, it wouldn't fly anyway if there had to be major alteration on the top of the landfill. So it works very well when we're able to just place everything on top. We don't, it's, it's a grassed uh, expanse right now, and then after we're done, it's a grassed expanse. Um, and we've actually found that grass grows pretty well even under where the panels are. It's just a more shaded type of environment, but it does, it does grow very well. Um, well enough that we have to come and we, we, we really don't have to do a lot of on-site O&M. Maybe somebody comes and checks it once a year, but we typically would mow it twice a year within the area that we lease. And what we do is we fence off the area that we lease from the city. That'll be a portion of the large landfill property. And then also the portion that we're, um, that we're using on the adjacent city property, we also would fence that off. And typically what we use is a, is a, you know, a black chain or a gray chain link fence. Uh, and that's usually it's it's the code strictly is seven feet. Um, there is some discretion that the local wiring inspector has in terms of that fence, but typically that's that's what um, that's what we use. Um, there are. I don't know if you have any other things as far as the requirements in terms of site plan review, but um, there's obviously you know there's a lot of environmental benefits to this in terms of. Uh, you know, in terms of the, the amount of uh, clean energy that it's generating, um, it's going to generate probably the equivalent of, I think, Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong, probably 30 or 40 percent of what the city uses, this is going to essentially offset or generate credits for. And what we do is we credit the, the, the credits are generated, the city pays us for the power, then the city automatically gets these credits on their accounts that they designate. And then they can, and then basically it's like a cash credit on that on that particular account, and you can divide it up the way you want, uh, so that it works. So you're not like applying all the credits to one account; and it gets overwhelmed. So you don't want to do that. But that's what we're working with, Chris. And on. Um, that's that's some of the basics. Uh, yeah, just in terms of site plan requirements, like you mentioned, that we we addressed each item in the milk in the cover letter there, but. We basically just got some road improvements up on the landfill. Um, everything's going to be on a, a 12 inch thick uh, gravel road, like you said, not to damage the cap. Just to facilitate cons construction and then um, long term maintenance. Uh, so we've got a road extension there and then also down here. Uh, but in terms of visibility and screening, you know, we're, we're set back behind the transfer station. It's pretty heavily vegetated around the site. Um, in terms of traffic, you know, construction is generally a short term process. Um, and then long-term maintenance is, like, like Joel said, it's just a couple times a year. Um, so we really don't anticipate any, any traffic impacts or parking impacts or anything of that, that nature. No lighting and any signs. We may just have a contact sign for MRESCO, 24-hour you know, contact for emergency. And I, I should mention the, s the schedule. We actually are under a, uh, a deadline. That's uh, because the state has imposed it uh, in terms of uh, new projects under this particular solar incentive program. So our schedule is, is pretty aggressive. We're looking at you know, doing the construction basically in, in the uh, essentially late summer, fall, uh, and to be done by the end of the year. We had hoped to be doing it sooner uh, originally, um, and uh, we were delayed by the, the net metering, the fact that net metering legislation wasn't passed in the state. And so we were kind of in a holding pattern, and now we're kind of moving ahead. We're we're waiting. Just talking to Chris about the fact that we're waiting to hear uh, from National Grid on their impact study, which is in process. So that's one of the last things that we have. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is that um, the city we're working with the city to take the portion that we're using and consolidate it with this parcel. Um, they are going to. Uh, Dave Valletta is working on a. They're going to file an ANR plan. I'm assuming they're going to do that with you all. Uh, that will just consolidate these into one parcel because that makes it simpler in terms of the interconnection. Um, I just wanted to mention that. So. Okay. Board question? Just a contractual question. How, uh, are the projected savings guaranteed or locked in, or what happens if you if you need to mow it once or twice a year? What if you never mow it and and the grass is 12 feet tall and, and it's not generating you know nearly what we thought it should? Or how does that all work? Um, 
Well, I'll, I'll first address kind of your the last thing you said. Uh, we actually, um, as we, are, we will be the owner and operator of the system, and we have uh, probably the most incentive of anyone to make sure that it generates as much as it possibly can. So in a way, we're kind of incentivized together, us with the city, because if we don't generate enough, we can't, we can't, we can't pay off the system. <laughs> right. um, and so that's a strong uh, driver for us to make sure that uh, we don't let the grass grow too high, um, and, and, and also that we are trying to be very diligent about making sure we don't miss anything and reporting the city on any other thing that could happen that could cause any shading to these, um, to these arrays. And with the landfill, it's pretty high up. There's not a lot of issues. There is a, I think there's the cell towers back here. Um, and that's, you know, it's, that's to the, it's to the east. It's not as much of an issue. Um, but, you know, we, we needed to look at, you know, shading here, make sure we stayed within an area that wasn't shaded. Um, and so we're, we're, we're incentivized together. We certainly are incentivized to maximize the production in the system. Um, there's not, uh, we do have a production guarantee that is part of our contract. Uh, and that's been negotiated. So we have to meet a certain minimum amount of production. Otherwise, there are shortfall payments that kick in that we have to make. Just out of curiosity, I mean, I think you mentioned right at the beginning, relatively speaking, you're not using that much of the available space. So is it just because that particular layout is the most efficient? Well, it, you're still leaving a lot of space that's open. Um, well, in particular on the landfill, the, the flatter portions are ideal for, for the ballast blocks because there's a certain percentage and slope tolerance, so we need to utilize the flattest portion possible. Um, there's a little more tolerance when you're using the ground screws, but here it's, it's flatter terrain and we don't really have that issue, but that's, that's the main driver. Um, yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of slope here, um, and, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we looked at it as, you, there, there, there are situations where you could be in a very sloped area say it might be technically feasible to do it but it's not really that economically feasible and so we try to kind of optimize that um, there's a, there's a lot of relief on this site um, it's kind of an impressive landfill uh, and so as Drew said you know we're really we've actually done a fair amount of uh, tweaking this to make sure that we're in areas that uh, we're not going to run into trouble in terms of insulation and, and having it kind of work with the terrain, but that's essentially it. This is a DEP question, so you've already got your comment, but you're putting a lot of weight on the top of the landfill. I mean, I know that's why you need the concrete blocks, but at the time you put them there, is that not destabilizing even the fluids on the ground? Well, that we had our engineers look at that, and there's, there's a lot of calculations that they go through for just for that reason, for loading. Um, both on the landfill, but also uplift for wind. Um, so yeah, there's extensive calculations that are done, and that's that's a big part of the, the DEP process. Got it. Any um, other questions? I was just gonna just quickly add that actually the Western Region DEP were the first group to approve a landfill solar project. I'm pretty sure it was Greenfield, um, and uh, so the guys there, Charlie Kleins and, and Larry Hansen and Dan Hall, they're they're great. They really know their stuff. Um, and we deal with all the regions. Um, there's, there's some of the best in terms of their knowledge, and, and they're pretty, they, they try to be pretty conservative, but they're reasonable, and so we found they've been really good to work with. But there's quite a bit that goes into, just in what you said, that's, that's essentially it. You can't, you have to spread that weight because you don't want to be loading any one point too much. Right. So that's the key. So open it up for public comment. Anyone want to comment on the project the landfill? I have a couple questions. Yes, uh, for, for uh, image sake, give us the questions, but they'll answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm Marlene Pearson. I live at 196 Glendale Road, so I have but quite a bit of the landfill and the um, also the section, a little bit of the section that was uh, that's owned you want by the point, city, too. Point to your lot. I think it's the one of these down here. Um, <laughs> I own two, actually. Um, yeah, it's the, do you mind if I, no, okay. Um, 
So I actually own this lot right here, which which goes right down the landfill driveway, and I actually own this is where my house is right now, right here. Um, so I own all of this, um, and then I've got a little bit of that. Um, okay, show us since you had. Oh so no, I mean it was, it was this. Yes. Uh, this um, property. Yeah, here and then and then this property. So these two, I guess, kind of making a horseshoe around mm -hmm. that other lot. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so I have a couple questions. One is I don't know anything about solar panels. So I guess my first question is, you already answered how long it will take, um, but how far away from a butter's property lines are these panels actually going to be placed? That's my first question. It looks to be half of your lot. I'm just wondering, sort of, is it like two feet away from the existing fence? Is it like, you know, 500 feet it's away more, from the existing fence? I mean, at the closest, if we're talking about, it's, it's more like a 100 feet. Okay. Um, and those are the lower set. That's yeah, that's the lower set. And the fence on that side, what is that? Uh, right now it's planned for a, a chain link fence. It's it typically going to be black. Black kind of disappears. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually not that looking. Um, so is that black fence going to, so there's already a fence up above at the landfill now. So is there going to be an additional fence 100 feet in? Is that sort of how you envision that? Well, in this, in the case of the lower part, I think what's going to happen is, you know, we're, there's a there's a fence that wraps around. Mm -hmm. We'll probably have either a gate or we may just lose that fence, and then the fence will just basically will loop around our system. That's that's you know what what likely will happen just in terms of minimizing minimizing multiple rows of fence. Right. Okay. And then the other thing is because I don't know anything about solar panels. Is there glare that's going to actually come off the solar panels because I assume they're some type of glass? And I know they'll be facing south, but I'm just wondering if there's going to be a glare to any of the neighbors or any of the abutters that are there. It's a good question, uh, and it comes up a lot. Uh, solar panels actually, um, the way they're, they're made, they have what they call an anti-reflective coating on them. So they're actually made to try to absorb as much light as they can. And so they, they really don't reflect a lot. If you uh, there's, we've installed panels along the mass turnpike. Some people might have seen them. They're, they're further east. We're actually hoping to be starting on uh, one in West Stockbridge. That's going to be. But basically, they they really don't they, they don't really cause much glare. We actually um, you know we've done a lot of work at airports and uh, airports are really sensitive to it. Sometimes you have to do a study to determine that because there there is. A, a, can be a small amount, you know, certain situations for, you know, for flights coming in at an airport. But for, for somebody at ground level, especially, there's really no, there's really no glare to speak of. I mean, they, it's kind of like the equivalent of reflectivity of pavement. Right, right. You know? And they're dark blue or black, um, so you really don't, you really don't see a lot of that. And I have one more question. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. It was just stuff I was writing down. Is there going to be any noise from the solar panels? Like, is there going to be any buzzing, humming, any of that kind of thing from the underground cable networking? No. The, the only thing that makes any kind of hum is, is what are called the inverters. The inverters are the, so basically it's, it's kind of like, there's kind of like three major parts. There's the panels, and those are generating the, basically DC electricity. Um, direct current, and then there are um, what they call inverters. The panels sit on the racks, and then the, through the wires from the panels, it goes to the inverters. And the inverters convert it from DC to the AC electricity, alternating current that has to be it's what goes onto the national grid's wires. Um, and the inverters are, uh, in this case, um, I think, sorry, I'm using a string here. So we're using smaller, a lot of smaller inverters. They really make virtually no noise. Um, 
the decimal rating is, is basically the whisper level um, if you have next to it. Um, and if there are any, any difference in the rating, you, you, you virtually wouldn't do anything. The other thing is um, they make absolutely zero noise at night because they're not doing anything at night. Right. Um, so those two things, are, uh, it is one of the nice things about about solar is that there's just no moving parts, so there's no, there's not really a lot of opportunities to generate noise. So. so if you told me that it was whispering, I'd go, hmm, I wonder if I mean that, but every house that has solar has an inverter. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, in, in their attic maybe, but they, every house that has them has that same arrangement. So if you think he's being honest when he says whispering. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a subjective thing yeah. too. It's hard, you know. I, I don't want to, but it's it's a it's a very it's a very low noise, um, and really, once you get any distance from it, that would be if you're right next to it. Yeah. Okay. Hey, well, um, I've <laughs> <laughs> thank you all because you're answering all mine. Too. Okay. <laughs> um, well, well, let's let's, it, let's try that. If you're here for the same thing, you think a minute, and we'll see if you have any questions. <laughs> Um, my name is Sue Bresnahan. I uh, live at 220 Glendale, so I'm further down. Further we down. actually live um, next to the empty lot where the fields are. So right now we have so a great far. view of next wildlife in the field and uh, an arena, and we're afraid that we're going to lose that with the solar panels. We really want to see that. So we're wondering what this extra little piece, is that going in the woods or is that going in the field or where is that going? There's a there's an open area here. Right. That's that the is field that the right field now where the arena is. Where the There's arena a horse is. Like that. Okay. That's where it used to be. Hmm? Yes, that's where it used to be. Right. That's where this panel system is going? Yep. I mean, do you put up stockade fence? You got a good view now, and now we're going to be staring out in our backyard at the panels. Um, we don't have no fencing there. Or are you guys? Are you guys yeah, in one us. of these? That's we're, right at, yeah. we're right at the driveway. Yeah, that's us. So. Oh, the, the dirt. Yeah, yeah, we got the dirt road. I know. I mean, the, the I know there's some trees here, but you kind of can see below the trees, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can see out to the field below mm -hmm. the trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, that's you know that's a, again it's a subjective thing. We haven't we haven't. Uh, Agreed with the city to do anything beyond the, the normal fencing. Um, you know, uh, it obviously will be a, to the extent that you can see through the trees and see the field. We're not we're not taking everything. We're not going. There's still going to be area left because, like I said, we have to shrink down to avoid shading. Um, so you know, there'll be there'll be more of a partial view. You'll be able to see the, um, the solar, but the you know the fence itself. Typically, it is like a black chain. That's the posted one, so it's going to be closer to the ground, I'm assuming? Um, it's, it's the similar. one by her house is going to be raised, so she's going to see it. That's on the top of the hill. Actually, it'll be hard for her to see it, sightline wise. That's going to, it's way up at the top. You <coughs> might be able to see some of what's up there, because it's, it's pretty far back mm -hmm. up this slope. Right, because you need it to be uh, on a flat. It may not be real visible. Um, um, you know this yeah i mean there's the, the height of them is similar i mean they're they're just they're about seven feet off the ground for that time so can i confirm that you're not taking down the trees between the existing fence and the lot um those are pretty high pine trees too right there um i th I'm pretty positive that we have designed this to, to not have to take down those trees. Because um, they're not on the south side. Yeah, they're on, so they're to the west. Um, there still is shading there, but we've kind of, I'm pretty sure that we're using them. Yeah. Um, we can, you know, we can, we can confirm that, absolutely. Any other questions? I am. Yes. Um, right now, uh, The city does access uh, just like a dirt path going in that big field. Are you going to access your solar panels from that dirt path, or are you going to access it through the landfill through road? Landfill. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll come in the existing gate here, turn around, and the, the new access is going to be down this road, which you have to get through this way. Yeah. Which, after it's constructed, constitutes no one. Pretty much? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's a couple times a year at the most. Yep. Okay. Does the board have any more questions for the applicant? I have one for Carol. Okay. Can we put a condition around the screen? Like um, we do around, around parking lots and Um. Yeah. So I guess you'd want to think about what you know if it's a solid fence on that one section or, or a portion of the section. You know, so. well, it, it just reminded me of the conversation we had around the park school with the type of vegetation. The, the pine trees are established and you're looking through them as yeah. opposed to if there was something right. maybe filled in or something lower. Well. Right, at the edge of the fence. Or right, or maybe, right, lower. Uh, a shrub or something, yeah, shrubbery. so it's more of a, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that fence is almost a whole lot length distance from right. yeah. the back of that and it's city land and there's already trees in it. I'm not not wanting to change your view, but I mean, I think there, it's, you know, it's different than Clark School. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Right. Um, you know, in that it's, um, yeah, it's a good distance. Does your black pants pretty well come on the side of the phone? Yeah, because it's gonna be it's gonna be seven feet, so uh, there's not gonna be much. I mean, the black vinyl that just kind of goes away. Yeah. You know, it doesn't care as much as it can go away. So I don't know if you want to. It's a better view than the panels, and that it becomes a screen, like like looking through a, and a bench screen. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Maybe 300 feet from the lot line, the rear of the lot line, mm -hmm. across the. Yeah. So a football field, I'm jealous. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the city? What is that piece of property that the city mm -hmm. wants? What's the piece of property? No, I think it's just been a buffer around the land. Yeah. I think that's what it was. Right. right. It was, it, um, that's why it was purchased as a buffer around the land. Mm -hmm. And uh, the city is. I don't know what we're going to do with the rest of the, the lot. Um, uh, I know there was talk mention of a tree farm um, uh, as part of, part of that lot. So uh, obviously it's not going to be tall trees. It's not going to be tall trees. Like, you know, you know, there's going to be some on the short trees. But I don't know what the city is going to do. But they did. We did want to. Uh, we, you know, we we did ask that when we separate a piece out, we're not going to take the whole property and combine it with that. Though. Is a small piece so that the city does have the ability to work with that other land. That'll be up to DPW. So Sorry. when we see the ANR, it's just for that lower usable section for the solar panels, and then right. you're keeping control for city use of the land that buffers around that. Right. right. That's pretty guaranteed to quite use. <laughs> um, any other questions that we need to deal with? So if we wanted a site plan to actually see what this is going to look like, do we have access to this that is somewhere? This large one, the small one is posted on the city's website. This is a gargantuan version, but there's a small one on the website, so it is already public. And we can get a um, copy of that, I guess, if we come in and have... You can get it online. It's, it's on, on the, the city planning website. department's city website. Okay. She just said it was really small and hard to see, but we can get it printed out somehow. That's true. That's true. You just oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you can print it any size you want. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Okay. Okay. Um, we would close. Public. Motion to close public comment. By Mark, seconded by Ann. All in favor? Do we have any other further questions? I hear a motion. Um, <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> um, uh, move approval of site plan for Glendale Road Solar LLC for ground mounted photovoltaic array at 170 Glendale Road 
Uh, Florence, map ID 42-89. Second by Ann, all in favor? Yeah. Second by Ann, all in favor? Yeah. It's, a, it's a really, I hope that this goes well. I, I understand you're here, but this is a really progressive thing for us to be doing. Um, it's the way to keep the taxes down in the future, if nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, over the almost on time, the second agenda item was the site plan for new convenience commercial. With two curb cuts and a sidewalk by Cumberland Farms Inc. at 53 55 Main Street, along with map ID 17C197, 23A 77. They must be in the hall. I'm just going to set this up. We've opened the agenda item for the Cumberland Farms project. You can come. So, how will you just um, slide over here? And you know, you can move this anywhere if you need to see on the screen or. Good evening, I'm Tom Reedy. I'm an attorney with Bacon Wilson uh, over in Amherst here on behalf of Cumberland Farms and its application for a special permit uh, for a retail convenience store and automobile fueling station, as well as a special permit for an additional curb cut and then major uh, site plan review uh, from the planning board. With me this evening, the site engineer, Phil Henry of the Civil Design Group, Maureen Schlebleck. Schlebeck, I'm so sorry. Uh, traffic engineer from McMahon Associates and Don uh, Vanderfen from uh, Cumberland Farm. And so instead of the lawyer talking, I'm going to turn it over to the engineer because you're probably more interested to hear what he has to say. Hey, good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Phil Hender with Civil Design Group. Uh, what I'd like to do is just walk, walk everyone through the existing conditions, uh, the proposed conditions, and 
some of the site amenities and features, and then I'd be happy to answer any, any, any specific questions. I've been told to keep it brief, so I will do my best. All right, so let's start with the existing conditions here. The site is an assemblage of two parcels, 53 Main Street and 55 Main Street. 53 Main Street being this parcel here, the Edward Jones building, uh, and obviously the Cumberland Farms building, which also fronts on Main Street, and has a unique uh, mm -hmm. radial shaped lot and actually wraps around the Edward Jones building. This building here is about 1,000 square feet. This building here is about 4,000 square feet. And there's and there's um, the USDs and the dispensers up on the street. That totals uh, <coughs> uh, just over a half an acre. And for those of you that have been to the site, which I'm sure it's everyone here, there's a, this property line is essentially indistinguishable when you're out there. Uh, Mr. Fox um, uh, lots are, are, are to the north and to the east. Uh, these these um, parking stripes right here are actually off property. <coughs> the proposal is to remove both structures and all pertinences and uh, underground storage tanks and, and dispensers. Everything will be raised uh, and, and new construction uh, throughout the entire lot will take place. As you're looking from Main Street here, the building is a 3,500 square foot C store facing that way. Uh, we wanted to bring everything up on the street. This was not our original concept plan. We did uh, we did work with um, city officials at the start, and we we, s we moved everything up on uh, on the street. So this is a 3,500 square foot C store front entrance here. This is an outdoor seating, uh, and that's going to be surrounded by a, by a stone veneer wall. We usually do an aluminum 42 inch aluminum uh, fence, but here we thought. Due to its proximity up on the street, and for aesthetics, we're, we're, we're bringing a stone wall around in lieu of the aluminum fence. It's going to be supplemented with um, some low lying shrubs on property here. Uh, 21 parking spaces, mostly right in front of the store. And there's some auxiliary parking here, which will primarily be for employees. Uh, there will be an emergency door, a secondary access door, I should say, for, for loading as well. Dumpster enclosure will also be located behind the building. <coughs> access, I'm sorry, uh, th uh, three dispensers in, in a 90 degree orientation facing perpendicular to the to the C store. Um, before you leave the graveyard, I'm, I'm get, just going to slow. I don't get 21 parking places. Six at the pumps. Oh, 15, counting the pumps. Yeah. I think 12 is what's required by the bottom. Uh, two, we have two, we're proposing two full access points. Currently there's, I believe there's three. There's a small driveway here, a sh sort of shared driveway between the Edward Jones and the Cumberland Farms, and then there's an existing shared driveway between these properties here and the Cumberland Farms. So in total, I guess we're, we're reducing a curb cut. We're going to have a proposed or an existing to be modified curb cut here and existing to be modified <coughs> curb cut here. You'll notice that the entire site frontage will have a new sidewalk. Uh, and it's a pretty wide sidewalk during that stretch of Main Street. So what we're doing is we're introducing uh, some street trees. And we are aware that, that there is, um, uh, we are aware of the letter that came across today from the engineering department of DPW uh, recommending a replacement of those species with different species and also uh, doing some modification to the actual plant to itself. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to to discuss more about that in, in a few minutes. But uh, the underground storage tanks will be located here, two 20,000 gallon tanks that will be servicing um, 87 or regular uh, diesel and 93 or super. What size are the tanks there now? 24,000, so I think yeah. 212. Yeah, I think they're 212. 212 or 380. Our latest revision also included um, the addition of bike racks along the front of this concrete pad here, just in front of the, uh, the freestanding sign, which is just located just to the right of that, that stone wall. And the bike path to the, is that the back of the property? 
Is there an access to the back? Mm, it's it's fenced in, and it's it's not even on our property. It's, it's, there's a shared access back here that wraps around this existing building. I believe that's fenced in. Up on Main Street, um, the the pedestrian crosswalk, which is a mid-block crosswalk, as is currently shown on this plan, is, is shifted about 20 feet or so to the east, uh, based off of the existing uh, crosswalk. And the the crosswalk design had evolved over time from, as as we understand it, DPW not even wanting a mid-block crosswalk to then reintroducing it, then to adding um, um, curb extensions, if you will, as traffic calming measure. So this plan reflects the the curb extensions with the crosswalk. Although we we are we do understand and we are in receipt of the comment letter, and we're going to be modifying uh, that crosswalk to match in kind what's out there uh, and existing in terms of length, width, and striping. But still with the curb extension. Exactly. And, oh, sorry, curb extension. Just the bump out. The bump out. So there's a protected area for pedestrians oh, on either side. Yeah. Yeah, there, if, you, if, you, if you could see the mouse from your perspective, it's this and this right here. And you said it was 20 feet further east? Uh, yeah, approximately. Right. So the comments that you're referencing, those are DPW comments? Right. That's yes. So we haven't seen those? No, they just came in this afternoon. Okay. Uh, there's some additional landscaping shrubbing towards the northwest or north part of the, or the point. Um, there, we're adding approximately 14 arborvitae to 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 the left of that parking, and that is that's there to supplement the already existing trees that are there that we're tr that we're going to be trying to save. Uh, but and that's about five or six feet from property line to to that face of that of that curb for that auxiliary parking back there. Excuse me. Yes. That's the trash containers. They're right there. What's behind the trash containers? Uh, grass. Nothing that blocks it off from. Oh, well, it's it's in an enclosure. It's in a it's in a uh, six foot high white vinyl enclosure. Got it. And actually, that that dumpster enclosure is about that sits about three feet, two two or three feet above existing grade, just because the grade drops as you're as you're going back, um, and because of the building, how long it is. We, we you know, the building's obviously flat, and we're married to the grade out front for accessibility purposes. So as the grade drops. Our building stays level, which which creates the need for some fill back there. So there's actually a very small retaining wall that you would not see unless you're standing in that grass strip. Um, so as in in light of these the the street trees, the the DPW recommended, and we we were in receipt of this today. We got this today. They're all very minor comments. Uh, there's a number of them. There's two or three pages of comments, but they're all very addressable. And we did meet, uh, we d I did speak with the acting city engineer, and I walked through some clarification points that I, that I wanted, and uh, we are, are good to go, uh, pending just a few questions and maybe discussion points uh, with the board. As far as the, 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 the street tree planters, they, the tree warden had recommended that we remove the birches and 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 replace it with um, a list of five other trees which we will which we will choose from but they also commented on the planter size the planter size is currently shown at, th at three and a half feet deep by five feet wide so the the sidewalk and let me just go to the site plan here with dimensions on it So the sidewalk is more or less eight feet wide. You see that that dimension there says 7.9 at that particular point. The 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 boxes that you see along the street that have the the, the letters L A in it are signify the three and a half foot deep by five foot wide planter. Uh, the the D P W 
comment insinuated that we should explore a larger planter and also uh, explore using what, what they call CU structural soil. Uh, you're allowed, and, and what that is is it's 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 soil that is structurally stable enough that we, that it, you could actually um, put it underneath sidewalk, but it also allows the you know, the tree roots to grow underneath that sidewalk as well. So I actually thought that was a, a very good idea, uh, and it, you you typically apply it two and a half, uh, two feet to three feet deep. So what I would what I would propose. Um, and you know we're 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 walking a fine line with making sure the the sidewalk is still wide enough for accessibility purposes. But if we have an eight foot sidewalk and three and a half foot deep, that means we have four and a half feet of, of sidewalk. We we could actually bump that planter out another six inches and make it a four foot planter with a forty eight inch or a four foot wide sidewalk, which uh, is still sufficient and meets code. Is is that eight foot dimension consistent throughout? Though it looks like on the east side. You don't have that. More or less, it go it, it, it does pinch down to 7.6 feet all the way on the right side, um, but it's it is fairly consistent. Obviously, at the bump out, uh, we're 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 proposing some landscape area, which the DPW recommended uh, removing, partially removing, which which I'd, I'd like to speak to that as well. But uh, but as far as the planters, I guess we could we we could live with making maintaining say a four foot wide. Uh, sidewalk and then maximizing the depth of the planters uh, throughout throughout the frontage. And when you say planter, you're talking about a space, not a pot. And yes, an actual okay. break in the concrete. A, a space. Okay. Yeah, break in the concrete. And what we'll do is we'll actually specify a soil spread below the concrete as well. And, and Sorry, I was just going to ask. So, um, uh, um, this, they're talking about structured or engineered soil versus an actual planter box, mm -hmm. like an um, engineered filter, tree filter mm -hmm. box, right? Did you, I know you just got the comments this afternoon, I didn't have a chance to talk to them about the alternatives, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if a filter box, a tree box is actually will allow you to keep it smaller um, so the sidewalk could maintain a five foot width because five feet in a downtown area is narrow we require six feet actually mm -hmm. so i think going down to four feet is um probably not preferred um but so i think there may be another alternative too that perhaps dpw didn't consider okay. was that tr would be a tree filter box um, and so we're actually only talking about three of these that are an issue so the little back corner has plenty of room on the uh, east side of the property and you've got two at the at the crosswalk that are in a larger area, so it's really I think the critical one. Mark mentioned is that one over on the, the east side that's in the on the street. Well, I would suggest all of them should be that way because we have a problem everywhere with compaction and trees just not surviving yeah. in the urban core. Yeah. So I think even though um, DPW may have only you know focused in on um, those I have to read and I'll look at the comment again. I think just yeah, well, for the overall clay health. Clay was a perfect way to build the road is probably the reason. What's that? Clay was a perfect way to build the road is probably the reason. Yeah. So Carolyn, you were talking about an alternative that would, what they've suggested or what DBW is, it seems to allow, that it would allow the root system to grow, you know, farther. Right. Yours, what, why, yours would give a more defined and, and increase the size of the sidewalk, but what would it do for the plants? Well, I don't know. That's one thing. Oh. I, I'm not sure if it would increase the size of the sidewalk. I think more, I, I think um, we just haven't had time to look at the two mm -hmm. alternatives, and I didn't have a time to, to speak mm -hmm. with DPW, um, and I don't know if that was on their radar in terms of um, alternatives but it's one of the things we're looking at for Pleasant Street reconstruction right, right. and I know we've, that's um, an issue that we've had for you know, right. the plant trees and year later right. Yeah. Dead. right and yeah. so um, I think that to the extent that you could potentially make it a um, I think you know we want to have it all right <laughs> a wide enough sidewalk and then trees that survive right. Right. so um, whichever system turns out to be better I think um, 
you know, given that, I don't know if there's a way to draft a condition that would address that to allow flexibility um, within that. Do you have an issue if, if the filter box is the direction that is the favorable option? You know, we, we, we want the same thing too. We want a wide sidewalk and the trees to succeed too. So I think, I think between everyone involved, I think we can come up with a, a plan that, that works. I think the other component that should be considered though is, is, is maintenance. Because uh, if there's no maintenance, then um, it's, you know, the trees are probably not gonna survive. And, I, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that a tree filter is high maintenance. I, I, I don't know. I don't have that much experience with tree filters. I'm happy to do uh, my research, uh, but uh, I think between our office, DPW, and your office, I think we can come up with something that, okay. that certainly works. I think my concern is that there are street trees and they're on there. And yeah, on right. Uh, then they'll have to be yeah. yeah, it's yeah. clear, so we'll just start figuring it out. I think, it's, I think it's important, though, that what, whatever we choose. We were trying to balance consistency, meaning like uh, having the trees either all in the right of way, which, which would allow us to, to show more trees, or have them, have them be all on site in larger landscape areas, but perhaps maybe provide one, one less one. However, the other concern that, that we have is just um, sight lines to, to, to the signage. We took a, a very... Um, conservative, well, we prepared a very limited sign package. There's simply just one sign over the main door, which you, which you primarily won't see if you're on the street, uh, and, and uh, a, a very limited, what we would consider a limited sign right up on the, on the street. So I would just uh, respectfully request that we consider uh, visibility to the sign when we're choosing where to, where to put the trees. I, I like the trees out front the way it's proposed. And I, I think if we can figure something out between okay. your office and DPW, that would be okay. good. Okay. Uh, I have. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, this is good. On the crosswalk, I, I live in Leeds, so I go on that road a lot. So right now, the crosswalk is just, I guess as you're coming south, just south of the friendlies. If you're going to move it just 20 feet farther east, right here. Okay. So, what's it going to be? What's it going to be in front of on the other side of the street? That I'm just trying to envision because there's a parking lot there. Yeah. It's not going to be in front of a driveway. It's going to lead into. It's basically going to tee into the existing side. Okay. But it, do you know how close? I mean, how close it will be to that that parking lot? Enter. I'm just thinking about. Yeah. Well, keep in mind there's. See, there's an existing drive here, which, right. which, the, which the existing one is right next to. So we're, we're moving it farther away from that. And from here to the end of the page is, is street parking. Okay. So, so that driveway is off well there. there. Okay. Right. While you're there, though, um, you've got a crosswalk coming out of from between two trees. Is anybody but me worried about that? Was that the DPWI comments about limiting the, the landscaping? Um, y well, yes, but to, to your comment, ma'am, the, the proposed trees, you mean? The concern being? Seeing all lines, the pedestrian. Seeing Side lines for the pedestrian. Yeah, I think what we would do in a, you know, a condition is just tree maintenance above, you know, to make sure that those branches are at a certain height so it wouldn't block any clear sight lines for pedestrians. Mm -hmm. and well, I think that's what the well, I think that's what the curb extension does, right? So that you're you're standing yeah. here, yeah. you're you're so ten feet in front of that right. tree, right? So I think the curb extension will take care of that. Yeah, I think it makes it more important to me that there is one. Thank you. So as far as the landscaping, they um, DPW didn't outright say remove the landscaping with the grass within the right of way. They had concerns on this. This is a this is a, a new sidewalk teeing into the existing sidewalk here, and on either side there's just small areas of, of what we spec out as long grass. Uh, it's DPW's opinion, and I don't disagree with them that that's pro that's probably not going to last between the salt uh, and the, the lack of maintenance probably. So they they did not say remove that. However, on the opposite side. We have a similar situation where we have grass here, but we actually extend the landscaping to to the side, and we actually approach the um, the, the ends of, of the driveway. They are recommending us to at least remove this landscaping here and this landscaping here. 
So one of the things I wanted to discuss is, I, I understand we, we do have trees here, so we'll need some sort of planter area, but uh, how would the board feel if, if, if the majority of this was, was concrete uh, to, to fit more, I guess, in the urban? What was their reasoning on the, on the north side to take away the planting area to the left and right of the tree? What was the they, they didn't specify, but, but my, my guess is the fact that it, it's such a thin strip that it's probably not going to last. Did they think it wouldn't be maintained or that it just wouldn't live? They think that it wouldn't live due to the salt. The and probably pedestrian activity back and forth. I mean, I, I mean, from a staff perspective, I would think that um, even with your tree planting, my guess is we want at least, you know, if we're doing a filter box, that you're not going to have plants, you're not really going to have vegetation right. around that yeah. anyway. And if that's not the case, you probably want a grate or yeah. something right. to help protect from compaction anyway. And given the location, I think it probably makes sense to make more of a concrete on landing on both sides and not do the grass because it is there's a mowing issue and yeah. then it you know you might have affinity paths people coming cutting across anyway and so okay. it might not survive. I've, I've seen the boxes. I'm, I'm thinking of a project <coughs> I know somewhere else, but that the the level of the of the tree ground was below the sidewalk. And the grate comes around the tree, and then it allows it to capture water and protect right. it from compaction. Yeah. And for my, I mean, it's already asphalt, so I'm, I know it. You know, we would say, oh, I don't want to not do dirt, concrete. but I'm uh, not do uh, concrete. 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 Thank you. Uh, road. And so I, I would feel fine about that not being grass. I kind of agree. I don't think I, we'll make yeah. it. Whatever yeah. you put there won't survive. But I was wondering if you if you did a granite paver or something like that versus just concrete or petunias, that would be, so it's halfway in between planting and just two more petunias. DPW is red, it, the standard for sidewalks and in the right of way is cement concrete, and then the pavers, there's also a maintenance issue, so they're reticent to introduce okay. new material, um, and also there may be some ADA issues or, um, would they feel that way about a grade? No, because that's for tree protection, essentially, right. around the tree itself, but mm -hmm. on the other side where there isn't going to be any. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about the filter boxes. Do those by default have a tree grate? The assumption? Yeah, well, yes. well there's there's an above ground box, like a planter, but obviously that it, that would not support a tree like this. So I think you're talking about a subsurface right. that, that has a grate. And I think I think you could find grates that are ADA compliant, certainly w certainly strong enough t to people to walk on them. So, right. so that, that gives an extra width, that available width that would achieve both. So, mm -hmm. so it, it appears that we were, I guess, trending towards the tree boxes and then filling everything in with concrete. Yeah. We have, have tree boxes here, 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 and here, and here. And then what you see here in this green. And so on that edge. lower bump out that's on the south side, would that have a granite curb? Yes. Yeah, it's all granite in the street. Yes. Vertical yes. granite. To have that, like the truncated going. Yep. Yeah. The grates work you well um, if you uh, have the grates that will accommodate the diameter of the trees and grows. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we would consider that. Okay. Just a no. Um, that those were the only comments of, of note to I guess to be discussed or appropriate to be discussed here. The other, I'm happy to go through some utility comments and sewer cleanout comments if, if the board would like, but I'm guessing we could talk about other things. multiple curb cuts, then why is it an issue that there will still be multiple curb cuts? Um, the way the zoning is written and purposely written is to say that, you know, just because there was a pre-existing condition with uses doesn't mean that that should be the way it is into the future. So you want to look carefully at every request for multiple curb cuts. Especially sure if there's this significant of a renovation, or is it just It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. In, in central business and general business, and I think entrance business, 
um, more than one permit or a special permit. But here there's, there are actually three, right. or two and a half, three, whatever. So right, but you're also eliminating one use anyway, right. so. Right, yeah. yeah. And, and what runs along the curvature? It is a very unusual pavement. A property line. So yeah, we've only we only hatched this to signify our property, but uh, all all of this is is pavement. Okay, that's really good. This is all pavement. So you you could be standing out right on the property line, and you would not you you would not be able to tell with a fence or curbing or landscaping. It's just a, a one. Mm -hmm. Is it a dentist? Yeah. 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 Okay. Then this and then other. This is a back there. Yeah, a new back <coughs> on the street. I just didn't think you had the back area of that too. Okay. I could show you the um, the architecture. Tom, could you help me with the actual photograph? I think that's probably the best. You scroll down. The, the ones with the P in front of it. That one. Yeah, that should be the one. Yeah. Okay. So this, this is a similar one that was constructed in New Hampshire. Um, as you can see here, the Commonwealth Farms is trying to attempt a, a colonial design. Um, the gable in front here, glass, glass storefront. Uh, the entire building is going to be wrapped with, with stone veneer. And that's going to be carried through to the dispensers as well. Uh, there's, there'll be supplemental doors. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the outdoor seating, which typically we spec out a 42 inch high aluminum fence, will we'll actually have the stone veneer wrapped around it as well. Uh, and, the, and the pergola above, just to note that, I think during our discussions with the city, which is unique for one of these projects. So, on, above that outdoor seating area will be a the, uh, this picture is very bright. I think I think the the actual colors are just a shade darker than this. It's a more of a tan and a uh, more earth toning. Mm -hmm. Do you have an elevation of the, the streets? So this this view right here is the front elevation. I could zoom into it. That that's from Main Street. see the pergola introduced and then this is the front of the building while we're looking at elevations um, that we mentioned about lighting can you walk us through exterior lighting on the building and, yes uh, there seem to be a couple hot spots for, for cameras and so forth in some areas. there are there are um, recessed lighting underneath the sockets throughout this overhang here, and there's four sight lights um, within. There are four sight lights approximate to the to the parking. There's there's one here. There's one here, and then the the other two are are in the back. Is one here, right above the dumpster, which also will give supplemental light to the to the loading, and then there's one back here. And are those um, are those bollards or are those 14 foot tall post lights? What are those? Are uh, those are yeah? Those are 14 feet tall, mounted on like a essentially like a sauna tube, mm -hmm. uh, just to give it some reveal so it doesn't get knocked over. Mm -hmm. Is it just a shoebox type fixture or is it a 
It's a yeah. It's, it's a very thin shoebox type feature. I believe there's a, there's a cut sheet in ten, uh, sheet ten point one. I'll see if I can pull that up. There's some staff comments about um, foot candles and, and the maximum allowable is five, and we're at seven, eight, and, and twelve. Is, oh no, we got out twelve and another one, uh, five and ten. But can you explain the need for the the high? Yeah, okay. Thank you. And I think the, the seven are above um, the maximum foot candle above the outdoor seating area, and then the eight foot candle is under the canopy. And I think we're just looking to appropriately illuminate those spaces um, where people may congregate, especially underneath the canopy where there's going to be you know, people taking their debit cards out, um, et cetera. So we know that five are max. Uh, we know, I, I think it was on raceway you allow more than five and, and what we're looking for is eight max here um, I think the average on under the canopy might be five point something um, sorry I don't know exactly what it is and I think so there's I think there's another slide in there that shows exactly what it'll look like it's the R1 you're going to be kind of sorry you mentioned because we felt kind of burned out. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That one should have, if you scroll down. Uh -oh. Frozen. That's I a good one. That the lighting on the street is not as worrisome, but I'm wondering if there might be some way to understand the capturing the light under the camera. Mm -hmm. Keep that going? Good, yeah. yeah, that'll show. This one right here? Yeah. Just how. Oops. Yeah, that's a good one too. Okay. Let me hold on. To show, <laughs> to show exactly that the, there's directed light and just what a night sky will look like. Yeah, I'm just wondering if actually the, the um, maybe the reverse is the one on the in the front. I don't know if there's a need to for the board to approve greater than five if it's on the street where you have street lights right. and you have the lights coming from the inside of the store reflecting out. Um, and then versus the canopy might be the one where you might consider something over the five. I mean, it's up to you. I don't know how, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you looked at the East Hampton Road one at night at all. It, it, that's a different dynamic because that's in the middle of nowhere. And I think we're all regretful, as Devin said, after that. that because I don't know how many on the board were here before. We did a field trip years ago mm -hmm. where we went up and down King Street with a light in the air, walking around, seeing you know, what's, what's five foot candles, what's 12 foot. And you, at five foot candles, you can see everything you need to see. And, and whether it's for safety or signage, I get all that, but, but the lighting doesn't, need, doesn't physically need to be more than five. Here you're right on Main Street. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now the lights on the, on the front of the building where, where the, uh, Pergola is, is that, um, is this 24 hours or lights off at 11 or 24 hours? So, so those lights at at uh, that seating area, would that those be proposed to be on all the time? That would be the proposal. Obviously, we'd be happy to work with the city if you wanted some um, lesser amount of time for them to be on. So if you wanted them off at 12 o'clock, um, back on again at you know, 5 a.m. at 12 and the 5 a.m. hiatus from use of that uh, front seating area, I think we'd be okay with that. And you would want that just for uh, reduced energy use, or why would you, yeah, or, or I'm, I'm use the board, I guess, because it's, it's on Main Street, it's in the downtown area. I don't see it as far as, you know, the five foot panels. We're not concerned about light pollution, so we're just curious, is it? Sky or in energy use? I was just wondering just for our operation and, and you know, three and at two in the morning, how we, you know, it's, it's, it's right on Main Street, but it's right on Main Street performance. Uh, and I don't know. What are you saying about the morning? <laughs> <laughs> you know, do we want to promote, if we have the opportunity, are we promoting people to congregate at an outdoor seating area at 2 30 in the morning? Where are the, where are the residences? in relationship to the back part of that piece of property. 
I mean, they I know they're back there. Yeah, yeah, there's a picture in the front. I know there's on the diagonal. Those are all businesses. Yeah. Not on the diagonal. On the other side. Across the street? No. Up top, behind it. On top, yeah, up there. There's Bratton Court that goes on the left. There's hot, there's there's residences yeah, back there. There's a there. pizza shop right there where that cursor is yeah. now. Mm -hmm. And then I think maybe to the right of it there may be a residence, um, but I don't can't really know the use. Yeah, there's four residences on Wilder Place. Right, there's residences right back there, but I don't exactly know how far forward they are. Mm -hmm. There's actually five yeah, residences there. on that uh, Bratton Court yeah. that we're yeah. put up with that. Yeah. Okay. Can you go back to the, the uh, photo metric that shows sure. like what you are at the plot lines and so forth? So it's supposed to be zero at the at the lot lines. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so we're so we're at zero. Okay. Uh, at the at the lot lines and this doesn't consider the the row of arbor variety that we're that we're planting here, plus the existing trees as well. Yeah. So show me the other boundary, the lower. Yeah. So across Main Street, you're you're at, you know, you're hovering at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So we, you know, you. W will you be able to see the light if you're standing on Main Street looking at the canopy? Yes, but that light can't see you, so to speak. So, uh, I, I don't think I have an issue with the light levels at the perimeter. I, I just, I, I guess, I would question the need for over five anywhere. So, what do we have to do? Zoom in on the camera. Sure. And that's and that's a function of, of that 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 reading capturing both sides of the canopy. It's in the middle. Uh, there's there's lights on both sides. Is it reflective ceiling or like a? It's a recessed ceiling. Like yeah, the lights are recessed in the in the ceiling. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer you know, more questions as we go. Uh, Cameron, do we have um, a special permit? Uh, do we have the availability to, like the fixture types? So you can go back to that where they had the cuts of the, you had the shoebox, but then there was a more colonial one in the middle. And if there's a preference, I don't know if the board shares my preference, yeah, or something like that. Yeah. The, well, the, the, those are the ones that are at the um, outdoor seating. So these are meant to be low, low light, like more wayfinding, not 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 performance lights. Mm -hmm. How tall are those? Um, I believe they are also uh, in like a, in the fourteen foot range. And are those the shoe box pictures? Are those the dark sky combined? Yes. Uh, yep. All the LED. bring up the actual spec itself and then Tom you want to show me where the actual sure. sign is so let me just walk you through the the sign itself uh, the sign is is proposed to be 10 feet 10 feet tall uh, and, and bookended by uh, white white column uh, white column shrouds in the, in the middle uh, essentially a six foot wide sign by seven feet or so totaling 42 square feet uh, what you see on the top panel is essentially a white metal, uh, white white metal with with the um, the letters are um, what would you call them? They're they're sticking through essentially. They're not blinking. Yeah. Uh, the 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 Cumberland Farms leaf will be green. The Cumberlands will be a, a blue, and then the farms will be a green. 
And then on the bottom panel, you have um, like an LED uh, reader, if you will, or, uh, that has smart pay member uh, on the top, and then it gives you two price selections, regular and diesel. I'm going to see where the actual so what you've got right now is existing yeah. signage is a 48 foot square square foot wall sign, and this one you just told me is 42 foot square. And so the the ground sign is what you see there is the 42 foot square. Um, the wall sign is 29. 24.9? Yeah, 25 square feet. 25 square feet, I believe. And those are the only two signs that are being proposed. So the there's not one sign. on the canopy? No, not on the canopy. No directional signs. I mean, it really is, it's built out of a pared down sign package. So this, this, this picture that you're looking at here is a photograph of what the actual sign would look like. But keeping in mind that this sign was actually a much taller sign, so you, you can envision the vantage point. You're looking at the sky. Our sign is going to be a more pedestrian level sign. Uh, and will not appear to be uh, looking up at it. With no external lighting on the echo. Correct. All internally illuminated. So I just want to clarify the um, so signs are not in the boards. Like, so there's a special sign application that's required for ground signs and wall signs. Um, in the general business district, there's a standard for allowance of ground signs if there's something about the property that makes it difficult to see wall signs. So there's a staff level approval if you can show certain X, Y, and Z. It might need to go to the zoning board because I'm not sure that the ground sign is necessary to under to be because you can't see the, the building on the wall sign. So you may need to go to the zoning board for that mm -hmm. piece of it. Um, so, I mean, the lighting right. is the lighting important, the sign, yeah. but, you know, I just want to be clear, the board's not approving the sign. And you can see the building is turned, you know, it's not on Main Street, right. it's turned, so depending on which way you come yeah. from, you could argue you need to have a sign. Mm -hmm. I think particularly if the canopy doesn't have signage, that's mm -hmm. another, mm -hmm. you know, argument in favor of that. Right. So just as a technical matter, is that something that we handle with your office? The building department, you start, so there's a separate sign application process. Okay. Um, so and you can start that, you know, okay. now. Okay. Um, so, traffic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to get through It's hot up here, Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Maureen Shabat, the Associate, uh, with the Associates. We're the firm that conducted the traffic study. So what I'll do is I'll just give you a brief overview of it, and then I'll be happy to go back to these sections and elaborate. Uh, so when we approach these studies, we generally do it in three steps. First, we assess the existing conditions, um, and then we project things out. In the case of this type of land development, we go out five years or seven years. Um, and then we look at the build condition against the existing condition and um, assess the traffic operations. So when we looked at the existing conditions, obviously we went out and field reviewed the surrounding street network. Um, we collected turning movement cones. We did that in January on a Thursday. We collected them from 7 to 9 a.m. at 4 to 6 p.m. We chose those hours because it would be when the peak of the roadway traffic and the peak of the site would coincide. Uh, because we took our, our counts in January, we did seasonally adjust them. So we got information from a, a nearby continuous count station, um, and that showed that January counts are about 11 percent lower than the average, so we left our counts by 11 percent. We also collected crash data from mass DOT. Uh, we looked at a three-year period that went from 2011 to 2013. And what we found was there was one accident recorded at the western driveway at the site and none at the eastern driveway. And when we relate that to the volume of calculated crash rates, really, it was not indicative of safety hazards. So next we went on to come up with our 2023 traffic projections. Uh, and we coordinated with the town in terms of whether there were roadway projects or specific sites in the area that we needed to include in this project. And we were advised that there were none. Um, and we coordinate with them on the background traffic growth rate as well. We applied a 1% per year growth rate. Um, so we took our existing counts, we bumped them up by 1% a year, and that gave us our future no build condition. So to get our future build condition, we looked at the site as it is today. We actually used the actual counts in and out of the site. 
And then we used trip generation rates that are published by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. We applied the land use code for a convenience store with gas pumps. Um, and we estimated what this proposed site would generate. And then we compared the two. So when you compare the two, what we're looking at for new trips in the morning is 11 in and 15 out. And in the afternoon, <coughs> excuse me, for new trips, we're looking at 32 in and 25 out. But given this type of land use, uh, again, you have to consider that it is a convenience market and gas station. So most of the patrons that come to the site are already on the road and route to another destination. We refer to that as pass-by traffic. Uh, and the Institute of Transportation Engineers publishes rates based upon national averages for this type of land use. So in the morning peak hour, about 63% of the traffic is assumed to be passed by. In the afternoon, 66%. Homer Farms has done their own studies. They show it even higher, but we applied the national averages to this. So when you consider that, when you look at that and consider what is actually the new trips on the road that are coming to the site, it's like uh, three in and seven out in the morning, 13 in and six out in the afternoon. So we take that traffic, we distribute it to the surrounding street network. Essentially, it was 50% one way on Main Street, 50% the other way. Um, and then we take those traffic lines and we conduct what we call capacity analysis, which really relates to the ways of the driveways. So we, we had existing conditions, future no build in our build. And what we followed was that level service remained A on Main Street under all those conditions. Um, and delays that were encountered were internal to the site, so it's always the people exiting the site. So at the eastern driveway, we're seeing that everything is level service D or better. So you typically, you've uh, it, it, the level service ranks from A through F. Level service D is, you know, acceptable generally in, in all conditions. Level service E means you're reaching capacity, and F is indicative of a failure situation. Uh, you really don't want to design for A because you want to put pavement everywhere. So level service D is considered adequate. So we saw the east driveway in the morning. The driveway is uh, level service C in the afternoon. It drops to D. The west driveway was level service C in the morning. Um, and level service C in the afternoon. So really for a, a commercial site on a main street, it was a really good levels of service. Uh, and then we look at the internal circulation of the site as well. So we, we looked at the driveways. Um, we, we did a series of truck templates. We did the tanker truck, we did the delivery truck, the grocery truck. Um, you need to be in a gas station, and you'll, you'll hear people at DOT agree with this, um, and pretty much every time you have to have two driveways. You can't get a tanker truck in there with one driveway. And, it, and if you do, it winds up being dangerous if you're going to force them to do three-point turns internal to a site. So, um, so, so you, from a traffic engineer... When you say driver, you mean curb cut? Curb cut, yeah. yeah. So from a traffic engineering point of view, you, you know, we would recommend that this site have two drivers. So, you know, we did run the turn wheels of all those trucks that I just mentioned, found that they could get in and out of the site adequately. And then the last thing we did was to assess the site distance of the two site drivers. Um, and we found that at each driveway in each direction, you had adequate stopping site distance. So there were no safety concerns for these there as well. So with all of that, we assessed that the site um, does not have an adverse impact on the surrounding street system. Um, I actually thought it was a good traffic study. I, um, I was very pleased to see the crash rate being so low. Yeah. Um, I, to the year 2023, you're picking up 36 cars in each direction, which I loved that be the number. I <laughs> that would be fabulous. We could go without adding any more than that. Um, I think we need to talk about the width of the curb cut. They were requesting 30 feet, and I we held our held our own at 24. So if we do entertain the second curb cut. Um, I, I, I want to really talk about the, the width of it. Um, I'm curious for you to show me how the transfer truck pathway matters for that second. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have this slide planned, so if you don't bear with me. I'll yeah, circle no, no. around. So what you can see is they're coming in, they're remote filling from here and going back out that way. If you know, and again, you can see how much of that curb cut they use. So if you do reduce the width of the curb cut, that is problematic if the tank the truck. 
uh, if you only had one driveway and you forced it to come in and turn and come back. To me, that's just a dangerous situation with people walking and talking on it. I mean, granted, the tanker trucks tend to come at the off peak hours, but still, you just, you don't want a truck that size on a site this tight to be able to quite turn, so you really do need the two driveways to get that tanker truck in the middle. How does the tanker truck, I mean, the existing conditions seem worse than the proposed conditions? How does how do the tanker trucks get in and out now? Um, I could... Oh, I didn't realize we had that. Sorry, I just put it up there. <laughs> so. I mean, the, the pumps are closer to the street. Uh, it's it, The existing conditions from the traffic sense seem awkward now. Yeah, I'm not sure. Do you know where the tanks are? Right? Tanks are right here. Yeah. Okay. When I was out there at one point, I actually saw I saw a tanker like like this across, and I actually saw the, the delivery truck with its back to this door and actually sticking out of the access drive, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, tackle this site as well and, and, and re relay it out to 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 kind of streamline that that circulation. So. Um, I don't know how they typically do it, but that's what I've experienced when I was when I was at the site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the the truck turn, which obviously plays a role in the width of the access, is also tied to the layout as well, which is tied to the site constraint. So we have a site constraint. As you move back, it, it it narrows up. So the farther you could push everything back, the more recovery time you have for said truck to enter that site or, or enter it 90 degrees with respect to that. To that driveway, which which in a, then in, in, in turn allows for a narrower curb cut. But as you can see, we're entering and exiting the driveway almost at 45 degree angle. So between the the the, the front of the, the the truck and and the back of the truck, the swing of the truck requires us for that 30 feet. I'm looking for a balance between letting you get your truck in there, obviously, but you've got. Uh, curb cuts on either side of a mid-block crossing. So I'm interested in slowing down that entering and exiting traffic. Yeah. And I think that's one of the genesis of, of, of creating that those curb extensions yeah. as well. Uh, we, we have looked at multiple uh, truck circulations. We looked at getting a truck around around here, but we actually have to stay on our property. Uh, the, the, the dispensers separation was much wider on our, on our initial concept plan. We, 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 sh we reduce those uh, with, I think they're 22 feet wide. Uh, a common farm typically likes them 35 feet wide. So we, we've, um, I guess we're showing you an evolution of, of, of multiple uh, concept plans and, and you know, is it ideal? P uh, perhaps not, but uh, I think there's a balance of adequacy and, 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 and the needs for, for the actual tanker truck. And if I could just add, because the curb extensions are not shown on this plan, but if you follow these parking lines, I mean, the pedestrian is all the way up to the parking right. line. You know, that, that's a huge asset for the pedestrian. It puts them right at the travel line. It makes them very visible. Uh, uh, could you go to the existing conditions page? What are, what are, what are the existing curb cuts now? What are they? Yeah. Um, the, the width. I could, um, I could measure them out if you'd like. Just roughly, yeah. I, I think, I would say this is, the so there's yeah. that gravel driveway, yeah, which this is one here, the one there. I would say that's that's in the magnitude of 12 to 14 feet. Um, I think this one is close to 30, actually, yeah, and, that and that one is, is also close to 30 as well. I'm, I'm, but I'm happy to scale it off. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, interested in hearing public comment? No. Um, I'll take that. Anyone here to ask questions or make public comment? Yes, thank you. I do. Um, name my name is Chris Kennedy. I live on Brad Port. Uh -huh. So I'm somewhat uh, familiar with the property. I actually had a number of different uh, questions. Um, one would be uh, the distance that's uh, from where your dumpster area is to the back of where your proposed parking uh, spaces end. Do you have a, a footage of what that might be? The distance, say that again, sir? From the end of the building yep. uh, up to the last par parking space. That right there? Right. Okay, so um, we have a five foot sidewalk and a 19 foot dumpster, so that's. that's uh, Sorry to change it, phone. So there is a sidewalk back there in front of the building? Yeah, there's space. a five foot sidewalk here. So that's 24. 
Okay. Uh, the other question I had is, I'm so curious about the definition of a parking space. Normally, you would think of a gas pump area as the antithesis of someone parking there. Uh, so I'm kind of curious how this got proposed as um, a dual purpose, that it's a transient uh, space for cars to be fluid and not static, uh, to be considered as a parking space. So, if I'm understanding you, you're asking why are we coaching the ones at the pumps and the SDF? Correct. So, in all honesty, that's how they function at the pumps. People do leave their cars at the pumps and go into the store. You know, whether we think they should or not, that is, that is what's happening. But is there a definition of parking? Sort of like a, a no standing or? I think that would be Right. And I mean, as a, based on our use, we need 12 parking spaces. And so we've, we've got 15 parking spaces uh, proposed. And I think what we were just trying to say is as a practical matter, what people will do is park at the pumps. If we reduced it and just said there are 15 parking spaces, we'd still be compliant with the zoning ordinance. So you're saying that there are 15 without counting the gas pumps? That is correct. Yes, 12.1. I also have a question about the uh, very back parking lot, or parking light, rather. And that was said to be 14 feet high. Is that going to be focused at all? Because that light is right in the back of the property. So I'd hate to have a, uh, you know, a light show for uh, 24 hours a day or night. Yeah, it would be uh, sh shut off, or essentially to, there'd be a shield. A shield. Uh, focusing light outward um, on the on the ten point on, on the lighting plan. There's zero foot candles on the ground at this location, which which does not take into account the the fourteen are provided that we're planting. There, so. Right, and those will be planted I think at eight feet installed, and they're just going to grow from there. Okay, and those are in addition to if I read it correctly, retaining the trees that are presently there. Yes, there's some existing trees up here that we're targeting to retain. Okay. The other question, too, is a little confused on the uh, sidewalk. Now, there's a sidewalk right behind your building, right, right there. And did you infer there was a sidewalk going perpendicular to that, uh, yeah. up towards the parking spaces? No. No. No, okay. no parking. It's, uh, lastly, do you have a perspective of, at all of where the old lots would be is in relationship to your new plan? And I mean, how much of that is incorporated from the old Jones building? So will the new building actually sit on uh, property that was formerly the Jones building? Could you go to uh, three pointering? So this is, a, this is the um, demo plan, which essentially is the existing conditions plan. But what we show on the existing conditions plan is, or the demo plan, the existing conditions, this building, which is gray, has that's the Edward Jones building, existing Cumberland Farms, the dispenser uh, dispenser area here, and this is the, the existing building right here. Okay. The, new, oh, the, new building. the, new. the proposed building, which is this dash line here. Yes. So it's really not sitting on any of the property that was formerly Jones? No. It is. No. The, 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 the Jones building is, the Jones lot is this lot right here, so it's it's half on the Jones and half on the Cumberland Farms property. Okay, any other public questions? One last question. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if it's showing two different maps or maybe I was looking at the bottom half as opposed to the top half, but the um, second set of parking spaces that are towards the back of the lot, uh, on one map it appeared that I counted five and on another I counted seven. There's one shot there and I think that that shows for five, but I'm curious if there was another map that showed seven spaces back there. And I think perhaps the dumpsters are yeah. not included in that. Yeah, exactly. The there there's five. Right, the one so you the says the fifteen and the other has the five. So that's what we're looking at. Right. And are the spaces uh, that are used for the dumpsters, are those also for parking spaces? Or those are not counted towards parking spaces. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from the public? I just have a, a uh, track. Oh, sorry. Richard, Richard Cooper, 136 South Main Street in Florence. Um, so I have a question about the 
traffic engineering. Um, um, do you work just for Cumberland Farms, or do you do other? No, no uh, I work for McNeil Associates. Uh -huh. We're a, a firm of about 170 or 13 offices up and down these coast. We work, you know, I work for NASA, I work for, I work for a whole range of clients. Um, and have you studied the, the number of entrance and exits of um, delivery vehicles and um, access for, for I mean, as we talked about the dumpsters, that can a, can a trash truck get in there easily and um, through the dumpsters? Does it look like the not lot without going out to the neighbor's property? Yeah. And this picture shows the single unit, the single unit vehicle in front end of it. As you can see there, it stays on that property. I was concerned as one of the committee members said about the um, your increase in traffic over the projected year seems seems a little low. Um, so if, if I could elaborate on that, I was saying that there's in new traffic. There's more traffic coming in and out of the site. There's traffic going up in the in the traffic report. But what I was breaking it down to is how many new trips are we adding to Main Street and bringing to the site. Yeah, if you want, I can cite your total in and out for Well, I think the distinction, and I may have confused it, if you're not telling us what the traffic on Main Street will do in that amount of time, you're telling us what the traffic attributable to your business right. will, yes. will be allocated. Yes. Do you have an actual number of delivery vehicles that, that come into the existing site? And and how that'll change in the proposed. So in, in our traffic study, we focused on the peak hours, we focused on the AM peak hour and the PM peak hour, because as I mentioned before, that's when the site generates the most and the street traffic is the highest. Common farms typically doesn't get their deliveries at that time, those trucks come in off peak hours. Um, so they wouldn't have been included in it. I mean, if they, if they occurred from seven to nine or four to six, they are included in our accounts, but we have someone from Common Farms here who can probably attest to that. They generally don't those Well, I think with this site, there's going to be greater underground storage, so the fuel tanker will have to come less. Uh, currently, there's 24,000 gallons available storage on site. This will be 40,000 gallons, so there'll be less frequency of trips. Also, the store itself will have greater storage for the products, so that delivery chuck, the grocery chuck, will have to come less also compared to the existing conditions. Question on snow removal. Um, it looks like it's all removal, no maintenance, basically. Yeah, and kind of to touch on that, we've had a, several meetings with Dr. Falk, who owns the dentist's office, which is right here, and he's also, I think, the manager of the LLC that owns Falk 41 Maine. And so, what we're doing is actually coming up with a, kind of a shared maintenance agreement with him because of the the, the lot lines. Um, and how difficult it would be to have a plow truck just plow some and not the other so we've been working with them and there's probably going to be some cross uh, access easements as well because his patrons um, you'll see here there's a sign there's no entrance he does have an entrance on Wilder place but his patrons will be entering through this site as well and so we're giving him an easement he's going to give us an easement towards the back here in case we do need to pass over his uh, property for anything and it's just it's just such a tight site that um, we thought that was the best solution so again to suggest to the board why the 30 foot wide curb cut it's you know it's not only Cumberland Farms it's also going to be that uh, easterly abutting though both of those easterly abutting properties okay. Can I ask two more questions? Sure. One, and these might actually be mm -hmm. Is there a net loss of street parking with this new configuration? Mm -hmm. Are we losing there's, because there's three yeah, I think there's actually a, a no net loss because of the swapping of parking location of that because the one of the cuts is being closed so that I can add a, I can have a parking space. And then my other question, and again this might be for someone else, um, it is a double yellow line there. I noticed that even this morning on the site, leaving, that turning left across that double yellow line is not technically illegal, but you know, I mean, is it, is there is there a way to either you know restripe a dash line or 
or should it be a no left turn, you know, from either of those? Yeah, typically the double yellow gets broken at side streets, but not at any driveway. Yeah, and, and that's just about all the way down the street. If you broke it at every driveway, you know, no consistency left. So it's, it's really. But I mean, it's, I, I mean, I'm just asking. I don't. Like, I really don't drive that much. Dr. Florence that much, yeah. but you know, even this morning, you know, I'm just kind of like aware whenever I do that, like, oh, I think I'm breaking a lot. And so, <laughs> if there's some increase in, you know, something, or is that something we need to be concerned so about? So the double yellow, you know, in the main or in the control traffic control places, if that's really indicating is that you can't pass, you know, Main Street traffic. Oh, really? Yes. You can yeah. turn. So, so like if it was dashed on one side. I'm lost. Forget I brought it up. That's fabulous. <laughs> Terrific. Right. Take it all back. Just restriped it. Forget <laughs> 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 yeah, I brought it up. That's good. Any other questions from the board? I just had a one, and just sort of circling back to the issue about the canopy lighting, um, and you asked about sort of what's around there. Um, the, let's go through anyway. Um, if you see the Wilder Place Street, um, the starting from behind that first commercial building on the front, yeah, all that, and then north is all residential zone, um, and then everything else is commercial. So there is that corner piece that'll be right um, there. Okay, I didn't know it was in the packet. Yeah. yeah. So all of that is residential, just so which will be the canopy is going to be you know, visible from that right. corner. I think um, maybe keep public comment open while we talk a little bit, but I, I don't see a strong need to be over five foot candles anywhere on the site for that reason, including um, I, I think for visibility and safety, the proximity to Main Street already uh, at, uh, on the front side, on, on the left, on the west, and the northeast, you know, we're right near residential. We are zero at the front and at the lot lines. Yeah, well, the, the experience of those houses on the wall will be the ones that notice the difference because the building itself is going to block right toward pretty far back. I'm not yeah. sure if you know just the back of it better than I do. But, yeah. So I think it is only that, and so it is only the canopy that has me concerned. Um, I agree with you. I don't see having street light on 24 hours a day at the street sitting area. So I would. I would, I would be interested in a in a limit to make life to a certain time frame. Well, I'm the one who brought that up. I'm wondering if one, I was concerned about the light level there. Two would be um, if if we say tonight lights off at one a.m. Does that set a precedent for any other business that comes along the line that? Florence takes off in 10 years and there's there's cafes and so forth up and down Main Street. The Everybody wants the open the pie bars. <laughs> and you just can't get enough pie at 2 in the morning. And so, um, you know, should we be more concerned about the light level there versus what time the lights go off? Again, I, 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 I brought with, the question. I agree with you about the light level. I mean, I think, um, and, and it, uh, it's from the past experience and I just don't think I think given the look, I mean, it is in the general business district, and um, I think that the, you know, for that issue that you raised in terms of um, it being an area where there might be more businesses that would be open longer, this is a 24-hour business, so I'm not sure that having the lights be on curfew necessarily right. makes sense. Um, I mean, a lot of times we say lights off light an hour after business, well, yeah, there's no hour after business. So our, our last discussion was in a very residential area. Yeah, right. right. Mm -hmm. about that. And really, if they're 24-7, you're telling them, you know, by, by, we would be telling them by restricting you know, the lights off, then you're not going to use your patio, even though you're open and people could be. The only light I would want to um, uh, put a restraint on would be the eight foot candle. And I'll go on your experience because I don't really, you know, sitting here, 
five foot counties versus eight. I don't know what that looks like, but if, as a board, previously you went around with a light meter mm -hmm. and you feel that five or six is, is adequate for safety, then I would support that on the county. Yeah, that, that five we did wasn't arbitrary, that it was a field of number. Mm -hmm. We went around we tested, tested it out. Mm -hmm. right. Could I guess? Could I make a suggestion? Given the fact that you've tested it out in other locations, if you approve us at eight, but then have a condition where um, you know if you want to come by or if you want us to test it with a light meter and it seems offensive to the city, we'd be happy to turn it down to whatever the city seems deems appropriate. But just in this location, I mean, they've chosen this number to have under the canopy because of safety, because they've seen that it's worked in other locations. They don't, you know, um, gone are the days of the UFO uh, gas stations where it just bleeds all over the place across the property lines. Here it's very direct uh, central light. And I think the photometric plan might be a little um, deceiving because of the fact that it's just right in the middle there is where the eight exists and it's just a culmination of both sides of the light. So we would just request that you allow what we've proposed, and then if it is offensive, we're more than happy to turn it down to something that works for the planning board. We're not looking to hang you out to dry like um, others might have. I would say you probably couldn't do that. You could do the reverse. Right. You, right. Know, you could come back and say <laughs> it's really not. Show us why it's not safe. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That would be a terrible thing to do, though, is to say, here we are back before you because two people have been mugged and are underneath the canopy. I, right? I mean, that, we're just playing with public safety. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you never, you just I never think, know. I think that we need 8, 10, 12 argument for safety's sake has been used. That's, that's the argument that's been used, mm -hmm. but it's, it's really for visibility and, and you know, more than I think anything else. And I think we've, we've demonstrated the board has that five is it's enough to see your debit card numbers. It's enough to see who's around, not the corner, but 30 feet away. There are no issues at, at five, I think. Is it visible? I'd be uncomfortable uh, proving anything more than five. I don't, see, I, I don't see a compelling reason to do that. Is it visible? I understand that if somebody has a debit card and it's visible because of the direct light, but would what's happening in that area, 92 feet away, I believe, from the cash register be visible? Because I think we want to consider that as well, not just what's happening under there, but with an employee who's monitoring what's happening under the canopy, are they going to be able to adequately? Go back to the photometric. I mean, that might be an issue for sure. the need for additional site lighting um, to be more consistent uh, so between the canopy yeah, and the building. Between the canopy and the building. So if you're going from eight down to one and a half, and then you're and then up to three yeah. in the building, that might be an argument for another, um, you know, street lamp. Or a 14 foot uh, pole light somewhere in between. But the, it, you know, we, we found more than five, and I think we demonstrated on, on, with the uh, race mark or whatever that 12 was like a UFO. Hmm. It was just, it was crazy. And the argument then was safety, safety and so forth, and visibility, and what about the clerk behind it? And so we agreed to it, and then we saw it built. And like, oh, Again. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think introducing a sight light in between the canopy and the front entrance, I, I just think we could accommodate that because maybe a wall pack or something like that. I, I'm not sure that's even necessary. I mean, you see the light, it's not, it's not that far away, you're inside, yeah, and that you're still going to have the light under right. the canopy that you're going to be able to see. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that the building lights right there at the door are 3.5, but then it's it's at the end of the parking spot that's dropped off to 1.5. At 1.7, they're picking up the canopy. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I'm comfortable with the five, and if there are two monkeys in Florence, the <laughs> applicant wants to come back and say, we need more light for safety sake. Anyone else have a strong feeling about that? Uh, I'm agreeing with you. Uh, any other issues that we want to deal with the curb cut? I was going to say, <laughs> you forgot the curb cut. <laughs> okay. um, I'm compelled by the, the traffic pattern. I don't like 30 foot, but what I'm curious about is we're only doing that for the 
the unsub two week truck that comes through, is there not a better way to do that with a, a slanted curb? Uh, you mean know. it might be run over? Uh. Yep. It seems like to me I'm, I'm interested in slowing the turning in and out of the, of the property more. I mean, I think what, what, I, what I think I'm hearing is that we're probably going to agree to a second curb cut. We agree to the design of the property well enough. So I think that's the big concession that we feel like we're doing. Mm -hmm. But now to go back and do two 30-foot curb cuts feels like we we for, for not a particularly good reason, because there's a lot of cars going in and out there, and there's a rare truck going in and out there. Although I recognize mm -hmm. I want the truck to be able to do it the way they're showing. Mm -hmm. So I would just propose that there could be some some rollover uh, opportunity for that that would do both. I think they're in and out both, and I know they made an argument for in and out both. There's an alternative that. In and out, and, and right, I don't yeah. know whether that makes yeah. any difference or not. And so, I guess just a point of clarification: we're only asking for one 30-foot curb cut. The westerly remains 24. Okay. The easterly is the 30-foot curb cut. Because that's, that's, that's where you anticipate we're coming in. Yeah. Thank you for. for sure. Thanks. So that's that's 24. 24 out. Out. Right. So turn in and then out that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's the entrance. What are your thoughts about that on like a rollover? A multiple curve or something? Yeah. Beyond my pay grade. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, guys yeah. boy, actually, if you can get in on 24 feet, why can't you get out on 24 feet? Mm -hmm. You should probably go back to that truck. Truck turn? Okay. Right, it gets in at 24. Here, here's a pinch point here, and then the right side of this trailer uh, is right here. Going out, though, we we are pinched by this curb cut right here, which which forms that 30 foot curb cut. And as it turns left, it's pinched on this side. So it's pinched on both sides. So uh, you 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 are correct that we can get in with the 24, and maybe maybe we gave the impression that it was under. under 30 so so maybe that in and of itself is the resolution but as you can see here like left turns in you have more recovery time as opposed to even though this is making a left it's actually making a, a right and a left mm -hmm. so that that's the need for the the increase in width on, on the eastern side since those are two ways are not marked one way what's to prevent a truck from going in the way um, well, nothing physically, but, but come with farms controls the trucks, they control the drivers and, and the routes to and from the, uh, the stores. And also, come with farms likes to fuel their uh, underground storage tanks on the right hand side, away from all the riffraff on the site. So coming in this way, would you'd actually be parked on top of the remote fills, you wouldn't be able to access, you wouldn't be able to fill the, the tank. It keeps the drivers safe, because he's got to get out into the hoses and also they want him on the they're all, they're all, they're all, oh, you're only anticipating, I mean, I understand with the oil and gas, the gas, but with the rest of it, you're only anticipating Cumberland Farms trucks. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, back to the, the curve, the raised curve, or the, that you can drive over, is that workable? So for the, so the main, like main yeah, extend this out everyday here. traffic, it, it has this, a feel for, 24 foot wide, but when needed, a truck can drive over it and make his turn, so forth. So would you want to do like a curb, essentially? Yeah, a slant curve. A slant curve. Slant curve. Yeah. And there's nothing constraining it at the property on the far mm -hmm. side, so. Over here? No, just like a, like a mountain of curve. So there's a, I mean, there's a sign. No, 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 we're talking about this, this much right Left here. Edge. And that there's nothing, you know, you've got you've got a tree on the planting thing, but you've got mm -hmm. you know, you've got plenty of ability to put. I'm thinking about the traffic islands, you know, the, yeah. where, where we design them so trucks run over them. Right. I mean, that's yeah. on, on roundabouts. Yeah. 
one no car. car. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that everybody was driving on. Right. <laughs> yeah. You you would wouldn't you want to reduce this side though? Yeah. As opposed to reducing the other side? Well, because the truck, what we were showing was the truck pinching up this side. So what we're saying is if there's any place that if we extended that with the mount. Right. That's right. I think you can get it down to 24. Yeah. yeah. So eventually, if, if the truck's there twice a week on off hours and he runs over the curb, no big deal. 98% yeah, so like, of the time, it visually looks like this is a curb, don't drive over it. And then we run over this piece right here. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And would you in turn want to move this curb and turn over? Yeah, that would narrow the curb. That's the one you want to narrow. But I think you could move that over. I don't think we'd be down to 24. Well, you would. You just move it over six and then we just drive over oh, six. Feet. So you, you, would so send, you, you would basically replace this whole curb with like a sloped curb just so that it's consistent. Right. Actually, it's sold for it anyway. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it, I think from an engineering standpoint, it, it's possible. Um, but I would, what if, I guess, let's consider aesthetics, though. Um, I guess it's the same as, as the asphalt, so. So right now, that's a slope curve on what's on the inside. This right here is grass. So you would basically, okay. I would, I would make this landscape area like 90 degrees here okay. yeah, so you would just make that 90 or, or cut it back i should say and then extend the six foot yeah. does that do anything to the bump outs the bump outs the no, pedestrian you leave those the same way yeah. i mean essentially it's it's i think you know six feet is six feet but i think um i think Depending on which way it was built, I think it's probably not going to be a noticeable difference from from the standpoint because it's the same material. Um, would, would we would we like the extra width? Yes. Yeah. Um, we know, and I, I I am sympathetic to the truck argument. I believe that one, and I I think I'm being clear about why we want to hold it at 24. And we we've had that conversation with banks and car dealerships and. You know, we're not just pitching up to you. You know, it's something we're really trying to hold to as a standard in town. Yeah. I can't see why we couldn't do it from an engineering standpoint. Okay. What about you? Hello from traffic? Yeah, I mean, it's, the truck's going to help us ride out. Everything. Yeah, it's just going <laughs> to ride over. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Is that more maintenance and repair, or is that? Probably. Of course. Yeah. 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 Except, well, except there, I mean, if you think about the standard roundabout, that's yep. a small, tight one yep. that's designed for that, and we're all thinking about one out at Look Park. Yep. And, sure. and so they're, they are engineered to do that. Yep. So, I mean. Well, that has a truck either. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That's, that's, right. Yeah. that's really kind of what we're thinking. Is that what you're thinking? Well, well, I was, you were talking a slope face curve. Yeah, I was thinking of a sloped granite curve so it's mountable. Okay. And then you'd have, maybe we, Maybe maybe you bury the curb a little bit so it's only like a four inch reveal as opposed to a six inch reveal. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, I think I, I want a forty four inch foot curb cut. Okay. That's what I want. And and I want it for the reasons of the cars, but okay. I want to give you a way to upgrade <laughs> your business with the truck. Any other issues we ought to discuss? Uh, just the DPW comments. It sounds like everybody's on the same page, but how do we make that condition just uh, since we haven't seen them yet. Okay, so, We've got the, the so I think that you could, um, you know, make a general condition that the stormwater and utility connections have to be consistent with the DPW and city standards. Um, and then the, um, they did, just so you know, they did make a, they did also make other comments about this whole issue about the public bidding, but that's just sort of an FYI. We don't know if um, they're going to have to go through that process or not. I think it's not quite clear, but that was just an FYI yeah. anyway, just so you know that was it. Um, and then, um, so really it's about the, so then coming back to the tree um, planting situation, you know, I think you could indicate that um, the 
minimum sidewalk. So you're showing four and a half feet in that one section? Yeah, that's four and a half feet. Yeah. You'd have four and a half feet of sidewalk consistent throughout. So I think that would be a minimum where those pinch points are mm -hmm. as opposed to dropping it below, but that the preference would be to, you know, do either engineer soils or a tree box, tree filter box, a special um, below grade box, whichever one accomplishes, you know, the best health for the tree and the widest sidewalk. Yeah. The good news about that is we all have the same little bit. They yeah. the dead trees that were right. right. <laughs> I want the grapes actually, um, it's a walkable surface, so wouldn't that give the, uh, so that you'd have a wider surface? Uh, yes, feet. it would still yeah. count yeah. towards the sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's my preference. I don't know yeah. the need to condition it. I'm yeah. willing to let that negotiation yeah. go on with the people that would you and the DPW, but yeah. that that seems to me the win win because yeah. you get the water, you get the health of the trees, yeah. you get the you get sidewalk. The so I think we're indifferent uh, to that, but I guess as far as responding to their comments, should should we proactively reach out to DPW and say we'd like to explore tree filters per the planning board, or, or, or will that come from your office? Well, I think it would be part of the, the conditions. You're not showing it on the plan. Mm -hmm. So basically the board would be approving the plans with the condition that the um, street trees be planted in either an engineered filter box or with structured soil. Perfect. Depending on, yeah. Since we always get to this point and it feels like we've just picked the chicken, <laughs> I'd like to say that actually I like the design. I'm, I'm pleased that it's a, a property that is replacing with the same existing use. Um, I think it's got a much better street view than the current design. And I like the building design better than the current design. So there are some positives, even though we haven't had Josh to until now. Yeah. Um, public Thank you for that. Are there any other comments that anyone would like to make? Yes, sir. Other than I totally endorse the idea of a maximum of five uh, candle power. Thank you. Okay. Move to close public comment. Second by John. All in favor? Um, any more discussion about a vote? Anyone have a good set of notes for a, for a motion? I think I do. Okay. We always do. I, every, every time I'm like, I want to take Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> 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 off the hook. Go ahead. Uh, we'll see if I do. A motion to approve special permit with neighbor site plan for Cumberland Farms. Um, 53 Main Street, Florence, Mass, map ID 17C0019 with the following four conditions. Um, that DPW stormwater and utility is consistent with city standards per DPW comments, uh, and that tree plantings maximize sidewalk width and help the tree by using engineered constructed using uh, or tree boxes uh, that canopy lighting be reduced to five foot candles and then two curb cuts of 24 feet width. Do we need to note the distinction that we uh, would allow the sign to curve for the 30 foot width? I don't think so. Okay. Do I hear a second? Just okay. one clarification. You mentioned the five foot candles at canopy. We are high at the seating area. And the seating area. So it should just be so throughout, all lighting throughout, throughout the site. Do you want to post a CO um, stamp plan showing what the lighting levels are um, at that? Mm -hmm. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.